All right, thank you. Um, hey, everybody. Hold on. Oh, there we go. Can every? I guess uh, I'd know if there'd be lots of comments in the chat if you couldn't hear me, right? Um, I am planning to go through. Are you still there, Mario? Yes. Okay. Everything cool. Worked. All right. Um, I'm planning to go through my rigs, uh, sort of one by one. I think the ideas and what I, you know, like to talk about is almost like best practices, uh, in, especially in relation to Moho. So, um, I think I'm, I've got a bunch of rigs up here. I've got uh, the Hellboy rig that I think a lot of people have seen on Twitter. Uh, I've got an, my original sort of hand rig that was sort of one of my first attacks of Moho. Um, I've got, this is another example more recently of, of um, Photoshop sort of files and um, art files uh, attached to a rig. Um, and, and then, sorry, the, it, it does a little weird uh, um, audio glitch when I like click on it. So apologies for that. Um, and then there's some uh, also like advanced kind of, well, hopefully advanced, if I do say so myself, <laughs> vector tricks for um, volume and shading. Um, and then we're gonna talk a little bit about acting uh, and using audio clips um, to plan your animation. Um, and then we can just go into sort of miscellaneous uh, stuff that I've made over that one's hold on and stuff that I've made over the years. Um, all right, so let's dig in. I'll start with the Hellboy rig. Okay, so uh, in my intro there, Mario talked about um, the fact that I've done some music videos, and one of the early music videos that I did uh, was called Rumble Seat for the Sa for the band called the Sadies. And I don't know if you know the Sadies or the video, but basically it's sort of a zombie afterlife purgatory sort of uh, exploration of of this guy's life as he kind of moves on from this mortal plane, basically. And he uh, one or one of the things in it is I really wanted this painterly look. And at the time, I was using After Effects. And it always really frustrated me the limitations of um, being stuck with with art that you couldn't manipulate subtly. You you sort of had your piece of art, and uh, After Effects can kind of warp things and the puppet tools. And it hasn't. I mean, that was 11 years ago or so, and it still hasn't really moved on too much from then. So uh, one time I stumbled on Moho, and then they had the sort of vector based. Uh, smart actions. Uh, and Mario, jump in if I'm using the wrong terminology and correct me. Um, the idea being that you can dynamically create change that you need for poses. And that essentially was sort of the light bulb that went off in my head. Like, how do you, how, how can you make sure you have the ultimate control that you need that you would if you were doing 2D drawings, but using a rig? So I'm gonna quickly just show what I mean by that. Um, I don't know if everyone, like if, if everyone at Moho is like a super user, but I just wanna show the, I'm gonna try and talk through the process of the type of things that I thought were like mind blowing when I started using Moho as kind of just a person sitting in a room. Um, and the first thing is like, I really like mouth shapes. I really like facial expressions. So when I found out you could kind of, oh, I gotta jump out here. Um, Whoa, where'd it go? I haven't opened this rig in a long time. Oh, I know what I did. Hmm, that's weird. Here, let me jump to a different rig. It's I don't know what's going on. I can show. Yeah, well, basically the the um smart action allows you to do this so within the within the um smart action i've got it so that the mouth opens as per a switch and you kind of basically make your keyframes you know uh, at the end of the smart action so i've gone in and you know had an open mouth and like an e to bring the mouth together and then you can do like an O shape and then basically like playing a piano you can kind of combine all these into 
the different shapes you need to do pretty complex shapes. And what you know, what I would do if if I if it wasn't Hellboy who kind of was always scowling is you'd add things like a smile. Let me go into this one and see if this is a little more clear. I think this is a good example of what I'm talking about. So before I before I start, let me make sure it's going to work here. There we go. I keep hiding the actions menu. Hold on. Go. Can I? How do I get rid of this web? Go to go to webinar panel there, Mario. Uh, you can minimize it. Uh, either way, it's invisible for us. Oh, okay, cool. All right. <laughs> you probably see me. It probably looks like I'm hunting around for the menu that's right there. Um, <laughs> all right. So basically. See, I've got the mouth starts at it. So, so okay. So let's talk about the rig best practices a little bit too. Like I always try to start with a neutral pose because I always think of these things like what's the what's the thing I'm going to want zero to be? So zero would be a straightforward expression. And then with a mouth, I, I have. Let me start with mouth one. Usually, I sort of open up the the face. You know, like this this sort of feeling here was the first time I went. Oh my god. Okay, this program's amazing because it's like you can now just sort of build in your pose right so that on a mouth chart on a, a animation mouth chart would be like your keyframe this this wide open that would be one expression then you go back in and you do your e pose right or oh here this is a, so i kind of treat it all like how you would do a mouth chart right and you can by the way this works for everything this works for arms fingers um um anything you want to pose out you sort of think in terms of the smart action being your key poses. And when you start doing that, then you start to think, oh, I can use this for any set of animation, right? Because I'm, I'm gonna kind of jump around in, in concepts here, um, but one of the things that I think Boho uh, is, is both, it's sort of blessing, and I don't think it's the curse of the software, but I think it's the curse of the person trying to use it, is you try to make a rig for every possible situation, just one rig and you're done. And that is almost never, possible right like i think there's a lot of talk about 360 rigs uh um you know rigs that just one rig to kind of kill defeat them all and and i think as an animator you never need that you know frankly uh, i've never seen a situation where one rig is going to solve every problem and i know that if you plan your rigs for shots you will solve all your problems so i think like this kind of mixture of rigs so this the reason you'd make a rig like this is for medium shots or close-ups right a, a place where you would want to have a character they're going to be doing a lot of talking in your show um they're going to be you know turning this you know that's too much but they're they're turning you know their eyes are open and closed they're going to blink you know you need all the main things but this thing wouldn't work for you if you needed an upshot right? Because you would need kind of a different look of that. This is very neutral expression. Um, so let's talk a little bit about sort of the stages that I would go through. So obviously I would bring in a reference illustration, right? That's just a pencil sketch, put it in the background, and then you over top, you lay, you start laying in vectors. So to me, it would be like, here, I have the, I'll separate the head out. We'll just deal with the head. I've got the bangs for the hair, because you need the overlap. I've got the brows on a layer, the, the eyebrows. I've got the nose on a layer. I've got the eyes on a layer. I'm going to go through each one of these. I got the mouth on a layer. And I got the head, like the face on a layer. And then the ears in the back. And then a piece of hair, just to sort of round it all out. Now, one of the things that I like to do, and one of the things that I think is really powerful about Moho, is I put, I obviously make a vector line here. I'll show you it. I have my vector line here. You know, your, uh, it's just vector. Um, 
illustration. Now, you know, you, you, we could do, you know, a whole hour on just drawing in vectors. So hopefully everybody kind of is caught up on that kind of stuff. But one of the things I like to do is I make the shapes a mask, right? Because you have the, the ability to bring in these really cool brushes. So if you look at this brush, it's basically like a fine noise texture that I've put on a brush and then blown up to a huge size. And then it becomes, if you look, it becomes the shadow in the eye cavity just to give it a little bit of volume. So the idea here is just to use the brushes inside of a mask to kind of fake volume. Um, and, I, and the reason that that's sort of a good habit to get into is because that's my favorite way to do mouths in Moho, um, which is again, I've got a mouth shape, if you can see here, and then I've got the teeth are in another vector layer inside the mask. So now the, the essentially the mouth is revealing the teeth inside the mask. And then when you're out of the mask, it's covered. So it gives you this really nice kind of um, clean mouth shape uh, and you can do a lot with it. And then you don't have to have a thousand layers and you know risk sometimes with this kind of layered artwork you can have things peeking in and peeking out you know um uh, when you don't want them to and the mask is a great way to make sure things stay inside so i've got the tongue inside and the teeth inside um and then what was the i'm just making sure i think i've got and just little things where you try to like trick the viewer into thinking you've kind of done more than you have so oops one of the things I like to do is add little a little bit extra at the edge here. So it's like it's not it's the mask, but then it kind of goes off the edge just to kind of give it a little more volume. It's not just one single shape. You're kind of bringing back in some of the illustration that you like to do. Um, some of the some of the little idios, idiosyncrasies of your drawings, because that's another thing too, is like, trying to make sure that you don't let the um, piece of software draw for you is a really big one, right? Like if you, if I go in here and let's say, I'm gonna go draw, try and draw something here. Let's say I make a new layer and then I draw, I don't know, a nose, right? And I go like that and then fill it in, hold on. Oh, I think it about a mask layer. Hold on, don't do that. It's not gonna work. So you have it here, right? Like that's fine. That's totally fine, but it's not drawn. It doesn't feel like you can see the artist's hand. You just, it's just like what the program does. And as powerful as Moho is, like if you let the program draw for you, you're sort of giving up what makes you sitting in the chair the reason to be there, you know? So to me, I always try to think like, what would I do to make sure it feels like somebody did something. So I put a little taper on it. You know, I change the angle of it. You know, I might even add points in to make it like a little more idiosyncratic. Like no one has a perfectly straight nose. You know, now you're starting to, oh, okay, great. Now, and, and one of the things I like about drawing with this way, and one of the reasons I kind of, I think this is a good, it's good to get good at drawing in Moho is you start to become like a vector sculptor. And the more you think of this in terms of a 3D model of vector sculpture, the better your rigs are gonna be. And uh, I'll get into that when I get into the term. But anyway, I just wanted to do a little side run into vector creation, just because I think that will help explain sort of why there's so many, you know, like look at all the weird little angles I picked for the teeth. Um, all these little, uh, you know, unnecessary lines in the eyes. It just all goes to talk about the form and not let the computer draw for me. Um, hold on, let me turn some of this stuff back on. And then I'm gonna just quickly go through a few of the the things I like to do for posing um, that give you that give you a quick expressive rig that does a lot. So you have Obviously you want to think in terms of emotion. So I usually just do brows. I go like up, like uh-oh. And as they go up, they sort of tilt a little towards the middle. And as they go down, they kind of scowl a little bit. 
you'd be amazed at how much expression you can get just by having a little a little bit of surprise and a little bit of anger and then you just find your balance like this this is you know this is someone who's like just hanging out this is someone's like whoa and this is someone who's like all right all right you cross the line um and i think like just that little, um, just that that thing right there gives you a huge range, right? Then you add in a blink. Now I like to go wide on the one because okay, let me. I think this is probably something that might apply with with each smart action. You get like essentially a half turn up and a half turn down, and each each one of those is one movement. So I have, if you look in the smart actions, I've got blink one and blink two. So let's cover blink one goes from the the middle point of the switch to the down position so my blink one is like a traditional blink right and then my because i like to try and be efficient with what it does and and uh, think about user interface if you're going to hang hand this off to another animator blink two is a wide expression right it's like so blink one is the blink and blink two is the opposite of the blink <laughs> like the wide and then again now you have a switch now, now you've only made two switches, and if your character was just getting upset, let's just let's pretend the scene is like a zombie weird gorilla's ripoff drawing uh, gets upset. Now you can do it. You can go, oh, you know, I'm I'm really mad. And my eyes, you know, right? Or you can go, uh oh, I screwed up. And that's a huge range of emotion for. Um, this is a huge range of emotion for a puppet and and believe it or not this can happen pretty quick right because if you're doing let's say um brows going i'm trying to think of, oh yeah if you're doing brows going up all you're really doing is starting on frame zero you're taking your brow layer and you're kind of just grabbing these points and moving them up like that's not much work right like if you if if this was classically animated you'd be like Frame, 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 like until your brain fall out. So this one, you're basically just interpolating these two positions, and it gives you a huge amount of control with a tiny little bit of work. Um, and that's the that's another thing that I like about Moho because I'm always trying to make stuff for fun and test things out. Like I can just jump in and do that without, um, you know, having to spend ten hours on some crazy complex rig. This is all simple stuff. Oops, hold on um all right and then from there usually i'll go okay this is a really important one too is you want to get a little bit of oh, hold on you want, it's like there we go you want to get a little bit of change of expression right because this is great but now you're going to start letting the computer animate for you which you don't want to do so you want to go wait is he confused right what's happening here so again in my i call it quizzical i make like a layer where you go you know warner brothers animation poster pose number one you know and then you go okay the other character's got to look sarcastic too right um and i know that that's sort of like a almost like an animation in joke to have like every character have this expression but you would be surprised how often having someone not sure is is like like okay so even this is a neutral let's say this is your neutral pose what you could do is this just that much and all of a sudden this is someone who's thinking and those kinds of little things go a long way um to making sure your expression is right um and that that kind of brings me to something i want to talk about too is when we're building rigs especially with face rigs um we really want to think about structure because there's something sort of unique to 2D, and I talk about this a lot with background artists with 2D animation. When you're cutting your shots from shot to shot, you can draw anything. So you could say this guy lives, you know, this guy lives in a house, and then the next shot, it's a house too, but now my house is green with like spaghetti walls. Like that's a, you could do that. Why not? Just draw anything you want. You're drawing. But because of that, you have this huge burden on you to make sure that your drawings from shot to shot um, really explain the form of the room that you're in or the thing that you're looking at. So you need to have these angles um, uh, uh, reflect each other and, 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 and describe the form so you're not confusing the audience. And the same goes for rigs. Um, and this is, this is kind of a big one for me. And um, um, 
hold on, where is it here? So like, let's say we take the mouth, right? This is an, uh, uh, a zombie dude. It doesn't matter, nothing's real. It's just a drawing, but we gotta tell the audience this is a real person. So when we open the mouth, we have to think in terms of anatomy. And the thing that I like to start with is to remember is like you have in the middle here a, hopefully everyone can see my cursor moving around. In the middle here, you've got a skull. You've got your main part of your skull and then you got another bone at the bottom, your jaw, obviously. But you gotta remember this whole piece of your head is the most solid thing in the world, right? Like that's your, any deformation to that part of your head essentially tells the audience the skull is deformed, it's crushed. So you really want to be careful when you're doing these changes that even though you're moving these vectors around, you're telling the audience, okay, this is a, this has real structure. So a good way to do that is the teeth, right? This these upper teeth, they're actually moving even more than I would like them to for the most part. But for for argument's sake, you really want to keep these the upper teeth locked in place, and then mostly move your bottom teeth and bring the jaw down. Because what you're, whether you like it or not, you're basically describing to the the audience how realistic, or not even realistic is the wrong word, how much you're you're describing the rules of the universe. And if you just make this like change and go weird, all of a sudden the audience is kind of like losing the physical attachment. And I find that's a really big thing with animation is like you have to stay. They talk about a concept called appeal, and part of appeal is obviously doing a good drawing, but it's also feeling like you can kind of believe that this character is real. And that I think is one of the really big things about thinking through your choices when you're making a rig. So even little things like you keep the teeth locked, but watch the nose, the nose deforms based on the lip. So little things like that, just tell the audience that this has real form, real structure, and it's following rules. And it can work for, you know, this is a more realistic drawing, I guess it's not really realistic, but you know what I mean? It follows kind of more traditional realism. Um, but it, you, this works for very cartoony stuff as well. Just kind of keeping a real head, like um, um, it, it, that's why I try to talk about it being a sculpture or a 3D model. If you were building this with a mesh, mesh is actually cool because it sort of forces you to keep the structure and the volume. And I think a lot of people, especially in with rigs, confuse squash and stretch, which is essentially a simulation of of. Um, uh, I, remember, I probably should have a, a Photoshop file open to like sketch this out. But squash and stretch is a, a principle of speed as much as and volume, but it's also uh, but it, it's not it can't go against the structure. So you'd never squash and stretch a bowling ball, right? Like a, you know that the whole principle of the ball bounce being rubber or um, I'm, I'm jumping around a lot here. So hopefully you can call me out later when we start talking um, about what I mean. But you you have to you're, if you make a bowling ball bounce and you squash it, it's not a bowling ball anymore, it's a rubber ball. And the same thing goes for physical heads. If the head can compress, it's not a real head anymore. So I try to keep the idea of squash and stretch completely in the jaw and the head relationship. So an example is like, if I do this, right, and I go down to here, I can, well, let me go find my jaw layer. I can bring this jaw down as much as I want, not as much as I want, but you know, quite a bit, right? Sorry, I got a couple of things going on here. So I go like this, right? And I bring it down. This isn't out of the question. This still kind of looks cool, right? But if I do that and then take this entire layer, make a keyframe here, make a keyframe here, is that where, where's my action end? 96 and do this and it goes you know now all of a sudden w w what's my skull right i've basically told the audience that this skull is 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 pasta you know so we just have to be really careful about like what we say like maybe that looks cool but now you just redesign it so he's got a skinnier head <laughs> hold on all right um and then let's talk about the eyes for a sec too I think this is pretty straightforward. It's all the same principles as the mouth. I have like a mask layer, pupils, and then the I think oh, and then some uh, detail of the cheeks. Now, one thing, and this is something that I prefer, but um, everyone's kind of got a different way of doing it. Is the eye, the pupils are on 
these sliders over here. Oh yeah, I also did a sort of quizzical eye thing, and and it all it just it, the reason I do stuff like that is so you can tweak in every angle. Um, but the pupils go left, right, and up, down. Now you can put them on a target and just move them around. You could move it around manually. I just kind of like doing it this way because I feel like I can really control the extremes, you know, like where the eyes. Because one of the things you notice with eyes is they don't. I don't even know if I've done such a great job of it here, but they don't always. Um, I'll make sure. Oops, wrong one. They don't always. Uh, they don't like because your eyes are spheres. They don't move it. I'm sorry, I'm trying to find it here. I promise I know what I'm doing. Pupils. There we go. Um, they don't move um, uniformly, right? Like they're not flat planes. They're on spheres. So when you make the eyes go up and down, you want to make sure that they kind of follow a little bit of the logic of a sphere. So uh, one of the things I like to do, and I don't know if I did it on this one, is like compress the shape of the eyes a little bit. Oops, hold on. It has been a long time since I've been in this rig here. That's for sure. Oh, you know what? This this one won't do it. Okay, never mind. But but think about in terms of of like compressing the eye as it turns and what your endpoints are. That's why I like to do the the um the, the uh, switches like that. So I can always control kind of where exactly the eyes are going to be. And you can, you know, like I said, you can, there's a lot of people probably have more advanced techniques for eyes than me, but I find that this is just a really simple way to, you know, control where the eyes are going to go. Um, and then let's talk a little bit about the head turn, because I think this is something that a lot of people get caught up in. And I don't even actually don't know if this is the greatest head turn I've ever done, but for argument's sake, the head turn, you know, this is where your your action and, and animation comes in, right? Like you do this and a tiny little bit of this kind of stuff goes a long, long, long way. Um, actually, let's jump over to this model here if we're going to talk about head turns. So I think this has a pretty good example of it. Um, here, I'll quickly go through the, the bones that I used. Um, so it's got a head turn, pretty simple only turns kind of like a little a little less than 40 feet. you can see the see how this kind of stuff you can see that it sort of deforms a little bit i could probably fix that and make it a little more consistent but if you're moving it quickly you never notice you know i think that's why you want to be keyframe thinking snappy try not to ever let the animation interpolate slowly because then the worst things about your rigs will come out so i've got left right up down squint blink I've separated them here. Oh, I separated them here. I was trying to do like uh, different, um, like you could do left and right separately. I still think like working that into a, rather than doing it manually, I think working it into a smart action is better. Pupils side to side, up, down, um, brows up, down. You can see little errors I've made, like the shadows. I think you don't sweat that until you get real into it. There's the quizzical thing I was talking about open mouth, probably the jaw could open a little bit more, but notice the top teeth are locked. Got an E, because it's really important to have that E shape, so they can go E. F is really important, so they can go. F. People who know me know why I need to have the F a lot. Uh, o is another important one. And then, so if you watch it, all this is built towards an audio track. So this is my wife, I think, doing a line from Dallas and Robo. Um, but here, let me play it for you. Shit. What was it? I'm so damn hungry, I can't even think straight. So it's like, you know, not that many things in here. It's not that Shit. crazy of a rig. What was it? I'm so damn hungry, I can't think straight. But for medium shots, you're probably covered for 90% of the medium shots for your Shit. show. So this I would call like a medium shot rig. Like the body doesn't just kind of disappears down at the bottom, but who cares, right? I'm only showing this. And that's what I mean about keeping the rigs um, bespoke to the Shit. shots. And then the other thing I find with rigging, like I have my little audio clip. Even if you're building a rig, it's really a good habit to get into having a little audio clip in there. Shit, what was it? I'm so damn hungry, I can't even think straight. 
So you go, oh shit, all these things that you need. Oh, my God. So Alan Greg can't even think straight. All these things that you need will come up in a quick little audio clip. So I was playing around with um with uh, bitmap, mixing bitmaps and vectors together. And I did this kind of Han Solo thing, and I just took a clip from Star Wars and slowed it down just for to make it kind of funny because I think the slowdown stuff always makes me laugh. And this so this this one is basically oh, let me turn off this back layer. This one is an example of using vectors and bitmaps together. So like his face is a line with a brush, or sorry, this the face is actually, in this case, um, a bitmap. I did the, the face and the line are both separate Photoshop files, but then I did his mouth in the way that I talked about before as a mask with teeth in there, right? See the teeth, the bottom lip, but tried to match the brush here to the look of the uh, bitmap outline. And this is, I think, a really fun technique to try and mix different styles together. Now, listen, this isn't the most expressive rig. It's, you know, Harrison Ford is a subtle uh, gentleman who doesn't move his head around too much. But again, this is a good example of like, how much do you need? Do you need it to go crazy? Probably not, right? So if you look at the rig, it's got way less stuff. It's just... The head turn, and I don't even have two directions here. I just have one direction. He blinks. He looks up and down a little bit. He's got an E. He's got an O. He's got a S, which is sort of an E with the with the teeth open. And of course, you need. Oh, I don't even think I did an F. I just put the switch there for fun. And then you know, get you can get a lot out of like right. Um, and that brings me to, I'm going to just jump into another uh, rig here. Now, this one is literally a rig I made for one shot. This is never going to be used again. It's from a drawing I did in Photoshop. I separated out the layers. Right. I, and these are just smart mesh. They're not even, you know, I don't think, sorry, not smart mesh. Um, uh, flexi binded flexi bound layers there's not even it's just weighted bones with targets right i let the computer do the interpolation like obviously if you go like this that looks terrible but for what i needed to do that doesn't matter so this is a rig you can make in five minutes less less than five minutes it can it can hit the gas pedal it can hit the brake you know uh the hair can well i got a i got um hold on i think I can, it's it's got an expression on it to wiggle in the whatever, but it can what it can flap in the wind. Um, I put one on here for the brim of the hat if I needed. I don't think I ended up using it, but really all it does this it goes click click click, just changing gears and it blinks. Oh, and then I made a really really simple eye rig, and yet it, until you zoom in, you probably didn't realize it was a vector. See here, it's like. It's just basically a vector mask and a blink. And then, you know, I don't even think, I don't even know if I uh, made a smart action. I think I just literally keyframed the blink. So yeah, so you have like five techniques all going on here. You got vector animation, you have weighted rig, uh, and um, uh, flexi, blind, flex, flexi blind, binding the layers, um, and a rig that took 10 minutes to build because it's just for one shot. Um, and then I think probably the most complex, I, I think I'm gonna, I'll wrap up this part of it probably, right, Mario? We, um, we can start to asking questions. Um, with just the Hellboy, which I think Hellboy ends up being kind of like the most complex rig because it has so many um, different techniques, but also combines things. So we've got like a head turn. And this is also a really good example of like where I had a ton of reference from Mike Mignola to like trace a lot of these poses. So I always knew what his front looked like. I always knew what the profile looked like. You know, it's got a little, I like to do a little subtle body turn, just enough to kind of 
get a little action in there. Then you've got looking up, looking down. He's got a blink. I love these eyes, obviously. This was such a cool design. I did, there's my quizzical. I think uh, it's fair enough. He's always quizzical. Got the E. Well, my, and a lot of the time the E pose, you need the mouth. So you go open and then you bring the teeth together. And then you got, oh, oh no, oh no. And then um, the other thing I started building in here too, which we didn't really, I, oh, I can talk about the hand rig real quick. But I also made a smart action that were the poses of the open and closed fist. So you can kind of open and close. And then you can, you know, have subtle animation in there. Uh, oh, and this, I forgot, I have a 3D model in here too. The, uh, the gun is a 3D model. So when he's holding it up, it's like, I just, it's like linked to the, it's linked to the puppet. So it's just like an OBJ. I think I found something online and like SketchUp of Hellboy's gun. Um, and then let's see an action. I don't know what's gonna if it's gonna play, but so this is a pretty complex rig. So it's it's a, it's not playing back at full speed. Um, and speaking of not playing back at full speed, I think a really good trick with Moho too is to think about putting your animation on twos. So basically twelve frames per second so that it doesn't feel too interpolated because I think um, computery stuff often feels sort of interpolated in 3D and too clean and 30 frames a second can be a little excessive. Um, all right, uh, what do you think, Mario? Is that, is that enough uh, blabbering? And we can like, I'd, rather, I'd probably want to rather answer some questions. <laughs> yeah, we can jump into questions. Thank you so much, uh, Mike. Uh, everybody's really, um, attentive to what you are explaining and there's people from all over the world watching us for example Jerry from Ciudad Jardín Argentina Chris uh, I think he's from San Francisco Jeff from Toronto Nathan sure. Missouri PT from Johannesburg Joel from Switzerland Guatemala Eric Michigan uh, Michael Mojed Iran Matthew, San Diego, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> I think I missed Vasily. He said he was from Republic of Moldova and Daniel from Trinidad and Tobago. So All right. <laughs> thank you. Uh, we have a few questions, uh, so let's get into it. The first one is about the way you animate. Um, do you record yourself? What's your acting technique to get your characters uh, to be alive? Uh, do you use uh, Frame by frame, animated references. Uh, how do you produce uh, this kind of acting to your characters? I, I, you know, I always say that I'm not like the best anim. Like I, I, I was. I feel like professionally, I was an animator for like six months. Like my my first job out of school was on a show called Angela Anaconda, and uh, it was 2D rigs. Fun, funnily enough, done in in Houdini, which is definitely like a sledgehammer to kill a flea. Um, and and I just found myself like I, I always try to do the least, you know, because I, I don't I don't sort of live for it like a lot of people. Like some people are just such artists of this stuff. Um, and and but to that I think like the main thing is to be um, observant of reality. And um, I think I think taping yourself is a fantastic way to do it. I would just be aware of the character not being you. So if you're going to tape yourself, you really have to put yourself in the mindset of the character and act like the character. It can't just be like what you, um, it can't be like what you uh, do. It has to be what the character does. So I also think another good way around that is obviously watch animation that you like. Um, but I really think the more we study film, the more we study movement, um, the, the stronger our foundations are because um, sometimes you can get into the trap of photocopying a photocopy if you reference too much animation, because a lot of the time the animation you really like isn't always the best animation because mostly it's about story. Um, so yeah, my answer to that would be, you know, study as much as possible kind of film and characters that you like, uh, actors that are really good and expressive. And if you record yourself, it's a fantastic way to do things. Definitely have a mirror on your desk and look at your face, um, but just make sure you're, um, just make sure you're you're in the spirit of the character. You're in character. You're not just filming yourself doing stuff. That's a mistake that I think you see a lot of people make. Mm -hmm. um, here's a question from Pierre. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, do you create your own bitmap brush or do you rely on Moho brush only? If so, 
how do you usually proceed to create them? Uh, that's a good question, actually. I, I really like the brushes. At, I would say 90% of the time, let me find something with brushes in here. Um, I think that zombie guy has some cool ones. 90% uh, of the time, I um, uh, use the Moho ones, but then change them. I almost never use them exactly the way that they are in the program. Not because um, they're bad, they're actually really good. Um, but I just kind of like to have my own so that they feel like my pen technique, I guess, for lack of a better way to say it. Hold on, let me find, there we go. So if you look at this here, I think this is just a stock Moho brush, but I think it looks really good. It's just this blobby shape that they have. Where is it? Sketchy line. I have like a million called sketchy line and inky. That's definitely me. All these here. They're essentially just changed versions of Moho brushes, just subtle changes. And then occasionally I'll make my own. I think I made, didn't make that one. This one, I think I made this noise. I like um, brought in, um, If you, I don't know if you can see it here enough, but I brought in basically a little spackle of noise um, for the shading on the nose. Uh, but I, I really think like some of these you're, you know, some of these almost like, how do I say it with respect, you're probably never gonna use this one or, or these like stars, but they give you a really good idea of like what you can do with shapes. So I always think if you look at the Moho brushes, they're really well executed, pick the one you like the most and just change it. Like go in and say, nah, that's that's not enough. That's, you know, that's, it's like, okay, let's do the brush jitter. Okay, that feels right. Oh, uh, oh, it's, uh, now it's a real brush. Like that could be a um, charcoal, but that, could be shading, right? These are all little things that you want to do as you're going through it, just kind of changing the parameters until you find something that feels right. You know, like rarely do you need this kind of uniform um, spacing like this, but maybe you have some like ants fall. You could make an ant, right? And then animate the ant moving in the distance. Now you can't animate the physical brushes, but you could do it from a distance and no one would notice that the legs aren't moving. Um, so it's kind of a convoluted answer of basically just saying like, I think these are a fantastic base, but you should always be thinking, what can I do to make it mine? What can I do to make it feel like something I would draw in Photoshop? And, and based on your own experience, um, in your, in your process of, uh, bringing something, maybe a vector from Illustrator, you rather using the vector important or you, or you prefer read drawing it uh, with Moho vector drawing tools? I almost always redraw it. And and the main reason I do that is because what I said before about, um, I'm gonna find an example here. What I said before about thinking like a sculptor, 3D modeler, it's so important to like have these points be on corners, right? Because when you turn the head, oh, hold on, when you turn the head, they're going to be the edges of the chin. So if, if you know, I think, I'm not sure, I, I haven't used it in a long time. So if, if the vectors come in from Illustrator one-to-one, -one, great. But you really need this kind of control over the chin, for example, or where the edges of the mouth are. And if you let, um, if you let the vectors interpolate or don't think in terms of structure when you're building this stuff, you're going to bring in um, models that don't, uh, that don't animate well, right? It's like, in th probably a lot of 3D artists are familiar with building the mesh so it deforms properly. That's 100% what I'm talking about. You have to build these meshes that deform properly. So um, I always find that redrawing it in Moho is almost essential for vectors. Okay, um, another question from Daniel. Do you think it's unadvisable to try to make a 360 rig? Yeah, I do. I think like uh, I can't imagine a time where you need it. That's basically my quick answer because a really good 360 rig probably doesn't walk, right? And if you're doing a long shot, why do you need it to be 360? So, and then if it's a really quick turn, like if someone's turning around to the camera, I can't imagine a good enough rig that has the high enough fidelity to do the turn and also then animate. So if you want to make a, if the camera's spinning around a character, for example, you need to see it from every angle or they're turning dramatically, um, why not just build that dramatic turn? I think that would be faster than building like a, a, a rig that does everything and then jump into your rig that is really like bespoke and cool for the moment. Mm -hmm. 
I just don't. Here's I've never an, seen a, a use case for it. I guess. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, another question from Eric. Uh, this one is from Eric Salguero. Uh, what's your best approach for rigging hands? Uh, here, let's talk about. I got a hand right here. The um, uh, I think for hands, you, you know, you can go as complex or simple as you want. Like you could get moho brushes. Like this is a, I think this can, I would consider this like a very complex hand rig, you know, like it does, it sort of goes, changes angles. And if you can see right here, I have a smart action for almost every aspect of the rig. So like the thumb, it goes, these are my key poses of the thumb, the far finger, the, you know, it's got a second thumb action. Uh, here, where we go, pointer finger. I did like what happens if it bends one way, you know, each each knuckle has its own smart action to sort of show you what it should do under specific circumstances. Now I'm kind of like, I don't even know if I need, I, this, is, this is almost stupid to do this rig. Like, I don't know where you're gonna need that much articulation. Maybe they're typing on a keyboard in a close up, but it was more of like fun to try, you know, like, like how would you keep it, um, how would you make all these things happen? This is almost like a 3D rig, right? But if you if your shot needs it, like you could take, oops, you could take a vector brush and do, you know, shape, and then do, and then apply a brush to it, right? And if your character is like a little cute, sort of like I don't know what's the what does this look like a little weird bear like what what do you need more than that you know the the answer is always just what is your character design you know you would never just say I'm going to build a, I mean I did because I'm a maniac but like you would really never just say I'm going to build a hand rig you'd say what what does my character need from a hand and I bet you could get some really cool expressive stuff out of this if you just you know did the right smart actions and stuff so I don't know if that's too vague of an answer, but I think it's like, what does the rig need? You got to build it to the rig in the design. Um, and with hands, I just always think of like neutral position and then uh, affecting the neutral position. You know, what, what do I, what is it going to be? And if you go back to this, like 90% of the time, you could just use replacement hands, right? So it also depends, like, do you need a hand rig? Why not just have, why not just draw some hands in Photoshop and do replacement method? Mm -hmm. um, another question from Jerry. Uh, thank you so much for this webinar. I'd like to ask how many, how much time did it take you to create and rig the character, a character like the Han Solo that you just show us? Uh, Han Solo is like maybe a couple of hours. Like you know, it's it, I think probably the longest thing in this is like drawing a drawing I liked. I probably did like 500 different <laughs> different illustrations. I don't know if I have any of them here. They might not be um, in the file. Let me see. Um, hold on. Anyway, yeah, I I, I don't have it. There, the the reference file is not there. Basically, yeah, it takes to me. It takes oh, there, like this kind of stuff. See my sketches in the background to kind of reference. That takes longer than doing the rig with this because these are really quick. Like they're just it's just flexi binding. Um, it's like I've got you know a quick a quick mesh on the face. Uh, I don't think I have one on the arm. The hair is a vector. This all is, you know, it's a really quick process. So I think like stuff like, this is what I love about Moho is like, if I have this idea, I want to do like a dumb Han Solo thing to make my son laugh, I can do it in like 10 minutes. You know, um, drawing it takes a long time, but then rigging it goes quick. And you just basically keep adding to the rig until you're happy. So this will only work for this shot, but I could sure go back in and keep adding and adding and adding until it was perfect, you know? Mm -hmm. But Hellboy, I mean, uh, Hellboy could take days, right? This this Hellboy rig takes, just drawing it in vectors probably took a day. Mm -hmm. So it's all vector, right? This is all vector, 100%, except for the gun, obviously. Mm -hmm. And that was another question, like, uh, if you uh, regularly use 3D objects into your Moho settings. Yeah, I, I actually find I, I'm not I, I would say I'm not probably the expert of how to do it. Um, but I think if you're if your um, object is like clean and the and the and the um, faces are all good and it's not too mushy, 
um, you know, all the kind of normal shit about bad models. If you find something online, as long as it looks correct, I just drop it in and kind of move it around until it sort of looks half right. And then I draw vectors over top. Like if you zoom in here, I'm kind of like cheating it, right? Like that hand doesn't look great. I probably would spend more time on that if there was a close up. Um, and then it just, yeah, I just basically bind it to the, to like just bind the object. Where is it here? Bind the um, 3D model to the bone. It's pretty simple. There it is there. You know, it's like, uh, I could, I'm going to break it here and, and it's going to be terribly upsetting, but like, you know, oh no, that's just regular squash and stretch. Um, Where's the orbit? Anyway, you get the idea. It's like, it's just in there, you know? So if you want to move it around, you got to go back in and kind of animate the vectors to match the, the move. But I just did this really simple. So I try to use 3D sparingly, but for stuff like guns or cars, it's great. Um, by the way, Rodney says, if you use Moho to composite or your final animation, or you use other software? Oh, I usually use After Effects um, just because um, it's a pipeline a, um, a lot of people can help me with. Uh, Moho's great. I think it really does a lot. Of, it, it kind of does the job for sure. Um, I just like a lot of lighting effects and stuff. So I'm always kind of trying to tweak it and make it look bloomed out and shaded. But that brings me to something that Moho is like really amazing is the Moho exporter. I absolutely love this thing. You basically make your like I don't think I have any set up here, but you make your like layer comps like you would in Photoshop, you know, like you'd, you'd go, I don't know, isolate, oops, isolate the head and then make a new layer comp and call it head, right? Then you go into your Moho exporter and then you'd go, um, wait, why is it, hold on, you got to load up. Yeah, you basically you load it up into the Moho exporter, select head. Now you can render each layer, head, body, arm. And then when you've exported that to something like After Effects, you can add shadows and lighting effects and, and not be stuck with this one giant alpha channel. So, I mean, that, 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 this is my, I mean, if you have to pick a feature, I feel like layer comp exporter is my favorite feature for that reason, because it's, it's so helpful with compositing. Awesome. That was a question, actually. <laughs> what was your favorite uh, uh, feature from Ojo? I'm, listen, um, it's obviously smart actions, but I think layer comp exporter is huge. Mm -hmm. And another question uh, was about what are your references in art animation? If you if you follow like the, the type of work in a studio and an animator in a specific. Yeah, that's it's a funny question. I, I always say like I'm like a film person, you know, like I have my illustration people that I love, but I feel like I'm an old guy. So like there are very, um, you know, like I love like Mike, Mike Manola and Mike Allred, pretty much anybody named Mike. No, I'm just kidding. The uh, um, uh, I love Jamie Hewlett. You know, I feel like it's pretty obvious from the way I draw, like what I'm trying to do unsuccessfully. Um, uh, but uh, um I feel like film is the answer. I, I, I'm really a huge film fan. So like, and that inspires most of what I do. I love action movies. I love Quentin Tarantino movies. I love Hitchcock, you know, like I feel like the more you watch film, um, the better you're gonna be, you know? I, I feel like that's always a rule. I mean, I, I love animation, but I don't often find myself getting ins too inspired by the specific animation other than to make more. I'm, I'm very much inspired by film and um, action. Mm -hmm. And just to close the webinar, one last question. If you are planning to use more Moho in your future productions? Oh, for sure. I, I, I you know, I, I, it's weird. I, 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 as I kind of progress in my career, I feel like I'm physically animating less and less, but the plan was with Dallas and Robo to do it in Moho. Um, you just get into pipeline issues and some producer somewhere sort of already made those decisions for you, which is a lesson I'm learning too, but I actually feel it's really inspiring to watch like Cartoon Saloon do it because um, I'm constantly like jealous that they figured it out because so few studios have. But yeah, 100%. I think it's like um, a fantastic way to keep costs down and and not compromise. So yeah, I'm I'm going to be pushing. <laughs>
Thank you. So with that, uh, we are closing the webinar. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mike. It's been a really insightful presentation. We have learned a lot. Uh, it's uh, it's difficult to find an, uh, an artist that actually has a whole uh, broader vision about rigging. It's not only about uh, adding more bones to a character, but about the acting and how important it is. Yeah, so, I, yeah, that's thanks. I, 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 uh, that's my favorite part. So, with that, also, we want to thank you, the audience that has been with us during uh, this presentation. I'm just going to share one last bit of your information for you. Uh, a reminder that this webinar has been recorded and will be uploaded to our YouTube channel. Um, Learn more about Moho, mohoanimation.com. Follow us on our socials, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. And also don't forget to join the forum because there are a lot of other animators sharing the same doubts or even sharing their own projects with the community. And also for more information about Mike, follow him on his socials, Instagram, the Mike Roberts. Uh, the second icon was supposed to be Twitter, <laughs> sorry about that, and uh, his website, Michael John Roberts. So with that, thanks again, Mike. It's been a, a wonderful presentation. Thanks for having me. So uh, thank you all, and we hope to see you in our next webinar. Stay tuned. Bye-bye.